Um, I'm Rachel Thomas. I am the founding director of the Center for Applied Data Ethics at the University of San Francisco and also co-founder of Fast AI together with Jeremy Howard. Uh, my background, I have a PhD in math and worked as a data scientist and software engineer in the tech industry and then have been working at USF and uh, on Fast AI for the past four years now. So ethics issues are in the news. Um, uh, these, uh, these articles, I think, are all from this fall, um, kind of showing up at this, this intersection of how, um, how technology is impacting our world in many kind of increasingly powerful ways, uh, many of which really raise, raise concerns. And I want to start by talking about three cases that I hope everyone working in technology knows about and is on the lookout for. So even if you only watch five minutes of this video, these are kind of the, the three, three cases I want you to see. And one is feedback loops. And so feedback loops can occur whenever your model is controlling the next round of data you get. So the data that's returned quickly becomes flawed by the software itself. And this, this can show up in many places. Uh, one example is with recommendation systems. And so recommendation systems are ostensibly about predicting what content the user will like, but they're also determining what content the user is even exposed to and helping determine what, uh, what has a chance of becoming popular. And so um, YouTube has gotten a lot of a lot of attention about this um, for kind of um highly recommending many conspiracy theories, uh, many kind of very damaging conspiracy theories. There is also, uh, they've uh, kind of put together recommendations of pedophilia, uh, picked out of what were kind of innocent home movies, but when are kind of strung together, ones that uh, happen to have uh, young girls in bathing suits or, or um, in their pajamas. Um, so there's some really, uh, really concerning uh, results, and this is not something that any, anybody intended, and we'll talk about this more later. Um, I think particularly for many of us coming from a science background, we're often used to thinking of like, oh, you know, like we observe the data, um, but really whenever you're building products that interact with the real world, you're also um, kind of controlling what the data looks like. Second, uh, second case study I want everyone to know about um, comes from software that's used to determine poor people's health benefits. It's used in over half of the 50 states. And The Verge did an investigation on what happened when it was rolled out in Arkansas. And what happened is there was a bug in the software implementation that incorrectly cut coverage for people with cerebral palsy or diabetes. Um, including Tammy Dobbs, who's pictured here and was interviewed in the article. Um, and so uh, these are people that really needed this health care, and it was erroneous, erroneously cut due to this bug. And so they were really, um, and they couldn't get any sort of explanation, and there was no appeals or recourse process in place. And eventually this all came out through a lengthy court case, uh, but it's something where it caused a lot, of, a lot of suffering in the meantime. And so it's really important to implement systems with a way to identify and address mistakes and to do that quickly and in a way that hopefully minimizes damage, because we all know software can have bugs, our code can behave in unexpected ways, and we need to be prepared for that. I wrote more about this idea in a post uh, two years ago, what HBR gets wrong about algorithms and bias. And then third case study that everyone should know about. Um, so this is LaTanya Sweeney, who's director of the Data Privacy Lab at Harvard. She has a PhD in computer science. And she noticed several years ago that when you Google her name, you would get these ads saying LaTanya Sweeney arrested, um, implying that she has a criminal record. She's the only LaTanya Sweeney, and she has never been arrested. She paid $50 to the background check company and confirmed that she's never been arrested. She tried Googling some other names, and she noticed, for exa example, Kristen Lindquist got much more neutral ads that just say, we found Kristen Lindquist, even though Kristen Lindquist has been arrested three times. And so being a computer scientist, Dr. Sweeney did, studied this very systematically. She looked at over 2,000 names and found that this pattern held in which uh, uh, disproportionately African-American names were getting these ads suggesting that the person had a criminal record regardless of whether they did. And uh, traditionally, European-American or white names were getting more neutral ads. And this problem of um, kind of bias in advertising shows up a ton. Advertising is kind of the um, uh, profit model for most of the major tech platforms. 
and it kind of continues to pop up in high impact ways. Just last year, there was research showing how Facebook's ad system discriminates even when the person placing the ad is not trying to do so. So for instance, the same housing ad, exact same text, if you change the uh, photo between a white family and a black family, it gets served to very different audiences. Um, and so this is something that can really impact people when they're looking for housing, when they're applying for jobs, um, and is a, is a definite area of concern. So now I want to kind of step back and ask why, why does this matter? Um, and so a very um, kind of extreme, extreme example is just that data collection has played a, a pivotal role in several genocides. Um, including including the Holocaust. And so this is a photo of Adolf Hitler meeting with the CEO of IBM at the time. I think this photo was taken in 1937. Um, and IBM uh, uh, continued to partner with the Nazis uh, kind of long past when many other companies broke their ties. Uh, they produced um, computers that were used in concentration camps to code um, whether people were Jewish, uh, how they were executed. Um, and this is also um, different from now where you might sell somebody a computer and then never hear from them again. Um, these machines require a lot of maintenance and kind of ongoing relationship with vendors uh, to kind of upkeep and repair them. It's something that a Swiss judge ruled. Um, it does not thus seem unreasonable to deduce that IBM's technical assistance facilitated the task of the Nazis in the commission of their crimes against humanity, acts also involving accountancy and classification by IBM machines and utilized in the concentration camps themselves. I'm told that they haven't gotten around to apologizing yet. Oh, that's... I guess they've been busy. Terrible too, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and so this is a very um, kind of... A, very sobering example, um, but I think it's important to, to keep in mind um, kind of what can go wrong and how technology can be used for, for harm, um, for very, very terrible harm. Um, and so this just kind of raises a question, questions that we all need to grapple with of how would you feel if you discovered that you had been part of a system that ended up hurting society? Would you, would you even know? Uh, would you be open to finding out um, kind of how, how things you had built may have been harmful? Um, and how can you help make sure this doesn't happen? And so I think these are questions that we all, all need to grapple with. Um, it's also important to think about unintended consequences, um, how your tech could be uh, used or misused, whether that's by um, harassers, by authoritarian governments, um, for propaganda or disinformation. And then on a kind of a more concrete level, um, you could even end up in jail. And so uh, there was a Volkswagen engineer who got prison time uh, for his role in the diesel cheating case. Um, so if you remember, this is where Volkswagen was cheating on emissions test and one of the kind of uh, programmers that was a part of that. Um, and that person was just following orders from what their boss told them to do. But that is not, uh, not a good excuse for, for doing something that's unethical um, and so something to, to be aware of. Um, so ethics is the, the discipline dealing with what's good and bad. It's a set of moral principles. Um, it's, it's not a set of answers, um, but it's kind of learning what sort of, uh, what sort of questions to ask and even how to, to weigh these decisions. Um, and I'll say some more about uh, kind of ethical foundations and different ethical philosophies later, later on in this lesson. But first, I'm going to uh, kind of start with some, some use cases. Um, ethics is not the same as religion, laws, social norms, or feelings, although it does have overlap with all these things. Um, it's not a fixed set of rules. Um, it's well-founded standards of right and wrong. And this is something where uh, clearly not everybody agrees on the ethical action in, in every case, but uh, that doesn't mean that kind of anything goes or that all actions are considered e equally ethical. Uh, there are many things that are widely agreed upon, um, and there are kind of uh, uh, philosophical, uh, philosophical underpinnings for kind of making these decisions. And ethics is also the ongoing study and development of our ethical standards. It's a kind of never-ending process of learning to um, kind of uh, practice our ethical wisdom. And I'm going to uh, refer it several times to, so here I'm referring to a few articles from the Marcula Center for, uh, for Tech Ethics at Santa Clara University. Um, in particular, the work of Shannon Valor, Brian Green, and Irina Reku has, is fantastic, and they have a lot of resources, um, some of which I'll circle back to later, uh, later in this talk. I spent 
years of my life studying ethics. It was my major at university and so much time on the question of what is ethics. I think my takeaway from that is studying the philosophy of ethics was not particularly helpful in learning about ethics. <laughs> yes, and I, w I will try to keep this kind of very, uh, very applied and very uh, practical, also very kind of tech industry specific of what uh, what do you need in terms of applied ethics. In the yeah, my caller said it's great. They somehow they take stuff that I thought was super dry and turn it into useful checklists and things. Um, I did want to note, uh, this was uh, really neat. So Casey Fiesler is a professor at University of Colorado that I really admire. And she created a crowdsourced spreadsheet of tech ethics syllabi. Uh, this was maybe two years ago and got over 200 uh, syllabi entered into this uh, this crowdsource spreadsheet. And then she did a meta analysis on them of uh, kind of looking at all sorts of aspects of the syllabi and what's being taught and how it's being taught. Um, uh, and published a paper on it. What do we teach when we teach tech ethics? Um, and it, a few interesting things about it is it raises there are a lot of uh, <laughs> ongoing discussions and lack of agreement on how to how to best teach tech ethics. Uh, should it be a standalone course versus worked into every course in the curriculum? Um, who should teach it? A computer scientist, a philosopher, or a sociologist? And, and she analyzed for the syllabi uh, what was the course home and the instructor home. And you can see that the, uh, the instructors came from a range of courses, uh, including computer, or a, a range of disciplines, computer science, information science, philosophy, science and tech studies, engineering, law, math, business. Uh, what topics to cover? A huge range of topics that can be covered, um, including law and policy, privacy and surveillance, inequality, justice and human rights. Uh, environmental impact, AI and robots, <laughs> professional ethics, work and labor, cybersecurity, the list goes on and on. Um, and so this is clearly more than can be covered in any, even a full semester length course, um, and certainly not in uh, uh, kind of a single, single lecture. Um, what learning outcomes? The, this is an area where there was a little bit more um, agreement, where kind of the number one skill that courses were trying to teach was critique, uh, followed by spotting issues, making arguments. Um, so a lot of this is just even learning to spot what the issues are and how to critically evaluate uh, kind of a, a piece of technology or a design proposal uh, to see uh, what could go wrong and what the, the risk could be. All right, um, so, so we're gonna go through kind of a few different uh, core topics. And as I suggested, this is just gonna be a uh, kind of extreme uh, subset of what could be covered. Um, we've tried to pick things that we think are um, very important and high impact. So one is recourse and accountability. Um, so I already shared this example earlier of uh, you know, the system that is determining poor people's healthcare benefits, having a bug. Um, and something that was kind of terrible about this is nobody took responsibility, even once the bug was found. Um, so the creator of the algorithm was interviewed and asked, um, they asked him, you know, should people be able to get an explanation for why their benefits have been cut? And he gave this very callous answer of, you know, yeah, they probably should, but I should probably dust under my bed, you know, like who's going to do that, uh, which is very callous. And then he ended up blaming the policymakers uh, for how they had rolled out the algorithm. Um, the policymakers, you know, could blame the, the software engineers that implemented it. And so there was a lot of passing the buck here. Um, Dana Boyd has said that, um, you know, it's always been a challenge for bureaucracy to assign responsibility uh, or bureaucracy is used to evade responsibility and today's algorithmic systems are often extending bureaucracy. A couple of questions and comments um, about cultural context. Yeah. Um, Melanie notes that there didn't seem to be any mention of cultural contexts for ethics as part of those uh, syllabi and uh, uh, somebody else was asking how do you deal, you know, is, is this culturally dependent and how do you deal with that? Um, it is culturally dependent. I will mention this uh, briefly later on. So I'm going to share um, three different ethical philosophies that are kind of from the West. Um, and we'll talk just briefly of one slide on, for instance, right now, there are a number of um, indigenous data sovereignty movements. Um, and I know the Maori data sovereignty movement has been particularly active. But different, um, yeah, different cultures do have uh, different views on ethics. And I think that the cultural context is incredibly important. 
Um, and we will not get into it tonight, but there's also kind of a growing field of algorithmic colonialism um, and kind of studying what are some of the issues when you have uh, technologies built in one you know, particular country and culture being implemented you know, uh, halfway across the world in very different cultural context, often with uh, little to no input from people, uh, people living in that culture. Um, and I, I, although I do want to say that there are um, things that are widely, although not universally, agreed on. And so, um, for instance, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, uh, despite the name, it is not universally accepted, but many, many different countries have accepted that as a, as a human rights framework and as those being fundamental rights. And so there are kind of uh, uh, principles that are often held cross-culturally, although, uh, yeah, it's rare for something probably to be truly, truly universal. Um, so returning to this topic of kind of accountability and recourse, uh, something to keep in mind is that data contains errors. Um, so there was a, da a database used in California that's uh, uh, tracking supposedly gang members, and an auditor found that there were 42 babies under the age of one who had been entered into this database. And something concerning about the database is that it's basically never updated. Uh, I mean, people are added, but they're not removed. And so once you're in there, you're in there. Um, and 28 of those babies were marked as having admitted to being gang members. Um, and so keep in mind that this is just a really obvious example of the error, but how many other kind of uh, totally wrong entries are there? Another example of data containing errors involves the uh, the three credit bureaus in the, the United States. Um, the FTC's large-scale study of credit reports found that 26% had at least one mistake in their files and 5% had errors that could be devastating. Um, and I, this is the headline of an article that was written by a, um, a public radio reporter who went to get a, an apartment and the landlord called him back afterwards and said, you know, your background check showed up that you had firearms convictions. And this person did not have any firearms convictions. And it's something where, in most cases, the landlord would probably not even tell, tell you and let you know that's why you weren't getting the apartment. And so um, uh, this guy looked into it. Um, I should note that this guy was white, which I'm sure helped him in getting the benefit of the doubt, um, and found this heir. And he made dozens of calls and could not get it fixed until he told them that he was a reporter and that he was going to be writing about it, which is something that most of us would not be able to do. Um, but it was... Uh, even once he had pinpointed the air and he had to, you know, talk to uh, the, you know, like county clerk and the place he used to live, um, it was still a very difficult process to get it updated. Um, and this can have a huge, huge impact on people's lives. There's also the issue of when uh, technology is used in ways that the creators may not have intended. So, for instance, with facial recognition, it is much entirely being uh, developed for adults, yet NYPD is putting the um, photos of children as young as age 11 into, into databases, and we know the error rates are higher. This is not how it was developed. Um, so this is, this is a, a serious, serious concern. Um, and there are a number of kind of misuses. Um, the Georgetown Center for uh, Privacy and Technology, which is fantastic, you should definitely be following them, um, did a report, Garbage In, Garbage Out, looking at how police were using facial recognition in practice. And they found some really concerning um, uh, examples. For instance, um, in one case, NYPD uh, had a, a photo of a suspect and they it wasn't returning any matches. And they said, well, this person kind of looks like Woody Harrelson. So then they Googled the actor Woody Harrelson and put his face into the uh, facial recognition and used that to generate leads. Um, and this is clearly not the correct use at all, um, but it's, it's a way that it's being, it's being used. Um, and so there's kind of total lack of accountability here. And then another uh, kind of study uh, of cases in all 50 states of um, police officers kind of abusing confidential databases to look up um, ex-romantic partners or to look up um, activists. Um, and so, uh, you know, here this is not necessarily an error in the data, although that can be present as well, but kind of uh, keeping in mind how it can be uh, misused by the, the users. <laughs> 
All right, so next topic is feedback loops and metrics. And so I talked a bit about feedback loops um, in the beginning as kind of one of, one of the three uh, key use cases. Um, and so this is the topic I wrote a blog post about uh, this fall. The problem with metrics is a big problem for AI. And then together with David Uminski, who's director of the Data Institute, uh, expanded this into a paper. Reliance on metrics is a fundamental challenge for AI. Um, and this was accepted to the Ethics and Data Science Conference. Um, but overemphasizing metrics can lead to a number of problems, including manipulation, gaming, uh, myop myopic focus on short-term goals because it's easier to uh, track short-term quantities, uh, unexpected negative consequences, and much of AI and machine learning centers on optimizing a metric. This is kind of both, uh, you know, the strength of machine learning is it's gotten really, really good at optimizing metrics. But I think this is also kind of inherently a, a weakness or a limitation. I'm going to give a few examples, and this can happen even uh, not just in uh, machine learning, um, kind of, but in um, analog uh, examples as well. So uh, this is from a study of uh, when English's, um, England's public health system implemented a lot more targets um, around numbers um, in the early 2000s. And the study was called What's, What's Measured is What Matters. Um, and so they found, so one of the targets was around reducing ER wait times, which seems like a good goal. However, this led to um, canceling scheduled operations to draft extra staff into the ER. So if they felt like there were too many people in the ER, they would just start canceling operations so they could get more doctors. Uh, requiring patients to wait in queues of ambulances because time waiting in an ambulance didn't count towards your, your ER wait time. Turning stretchers into beds by putting them in hallways. Um, and there were also big discrepancies in the numbers reported by hospitals versus by patients. And so if you ask the hospital on average how long are people waiting, uh, you get a very different answer than when you were asking the patients how long did you have to wait. Um, another, uh, another example is uh, essay grading software. Um, and so this uh, essay grading software, I believe, is being used in 22 states now in the United States. Um, yes, 22 states, and it tends to focus on metrics like sentence length, vocabulary, spelling, subject verb agreement, um, because these are the things that we, we know how to measure and how to measure with a computer. Uh, but it can evaluate things like creativity or, um, or novelty. However, gibberish essays with lots of sophisticated words score well, and there are even examples of people um, creating computer programs to generate uh, these kind of gibberish, sophisticated essays, and then they're you know graded by this other computer program and, and highly rated. Um, there's also bias in this. Um, essays by African American students received lower grades from the computer than from expert human graders, and essays by students from mainland China received higher scores from the computer than from expert human graders. And the uh, authors of this study thought that they, uh, this, uh, this result suggests they may be using chunks of pre-memorized text uh, that, that score well. And this is, these are just kind of two examples. I have a bunch more in the blog post and even more in the paper of, of uh, ways that metrics can invite uh, manipulation and gaming whenever they're, they're given a lot of emphasis. And this is a, 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 a Goodhart's laws, a, kind of a law that a lot of people talk about. And it's this idea that the, the, the more you rely on a metric, the kind of the less reliable it becomes. So returning to this example of feedback loops and recommendation systems, um, Guillaume Chaslot is a former uh, uh, Google slash YouTube engineer. Uh, YouTube is owned by Google. And he wrote a really great post, and he's done a ton to raise awareness about this issue and founded the nonprofit um, Algo Transparency, which kind of externally tries to monitor YouTube's recommendations. He's partnered with The Guardian and The Wall Street Journal to do investigations. Uh, but he wrote a post around how kind of in the in the earlier days, uh, the recommendation system was designed to maximize watch time. And so and, and this is a, this is something else that's often going on with metrics is that um, any metric is just a proxy for what you truly care about. And so here, you know, the team at, at Google is saying, well, you know, if you're watching more YouTube, it signals to, to us that they're happier. Um, however, um, this also ends up incentivizing content that tells you the rest of the media is lying because um, kind of 
believing that everybody else is lying will encourage you to spend more time on a particular platform. Um, so Guillaume wrote a great post about this uh, um, kind of mechanism that's at play. And, you know, this is not just YouTube. This is any recommendation system could, uh, uh, I think, be... Uh, susceptible to this. And there has been a lot of talk about uh, kind of uh, issues with many recommendation systems across platforms. Um, but it is it is something to be mindful of and something that the, the uh, kind of creators of this did not anticipate. Then um, last year, uh, uh, Guillaume kind of gathered this data on, uh, so here the x-axis is the number of channels, uh, number of YouTube channels recommending a video, and the y-axis is the log of the views. And we see this extreme outlier, which was Russia's Today take, uh, Russia Today's take on the Mueller report. Um, and this is something that um, uh, Guillaume observed and then was uh, picked up by the, the Washington Post. Uh, but this, this strongly suggests that Russia Today has perhaps gamed the, the uh, recommendation algorithm, which is which is not surprising, and it's something that I think many content creators are conscious of and trying to uh, you know experiment and see what what gets uh, more heavily recommended and thus more views. Um, so it's it's also important to note that our online environments are designed to be addictive, and so um, when kind of what we click on is often used as a proxy of of what we enjoy or what we like, um, that's not necessarily though for of our kind of like our best selves or our higher selves. It's you know it's what we're clicking on in this uh, kind of highly uh, addictive uh, environment that's often appealing to. Um, some of our, our kind of lower instincts, say Niptefekci uses the analogy of a, of a cafeteria that's kind of shoving salty, sugary, fatty foods in our faces and then learning that, hey, people really like salty, sugary, fatty foods, which um, I think most of us do in a kind of very uh, primal way. Uh, but we often, you know, kind of our higher self is like, oh, I don't want to be eating junk food all the time. Um, and online, we often kind of don't have a, um, great mechanisms to say, you know, like, oh, I really want to read like uh, more long form articles that took months to research and are going to take a long time to digest. Uh, while we may want to do that, our online environments are not, not always conducive to it. Yes? So if I make a comment about the false sense of security argument, which is very relevant to masks and things, um, did you have anything to say about uh, this false sense of security argument? Um, can you say more? Um, there's a common feedback at the moment that people shouldn't wear masks because they might have a false sense of security. Um, does that kind of make sense to you from an ethical point of view to be telling people that? Um, no, that is, I don't think that's a good argument at all. Um, in general, uh, there's so many, and pe other people, including Jeremy, have pointed this out. There's so many uh, actions we take to make our lives safer, whether that's wearing seatbelts or wearing helmets when biking, um, practicing safe sex, like all sorts of things where we really want to um, maximize our safety. Um, and so I think, and, and Zainab Defecti had a great thread on this today of, um, it's not that there can never be any sort of impact in which people have a false sense of security, but it is something that you would really want to be gathering data on and build a strong case around and not just assume it's going to happen. Um, and that in most cases people can think of, even if that is a small second order effect, the effect of doing something that increases safety tends to have a much larger impact on actually increasing safety. Do you have anything to add to that? or? Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, a lot of our incentives are focused on short-term metrics. Uh, Long-term things are much harder to, to measure um, and often involve kind of complex relationships. And then the, the fundamental business model of, of most of the tech companies is around manipulating people's behavior and monopolizing their time. And these things, I don't think in advertising is inherently bad, um, but they, uh, I think it can be negative when, when taken to an extreme. Um, there's a great essay by James Grimmelman, The Platform is the Message, and he points out these platforms are structurally at war with themselves. The same characteristics that make outrageous and offensive content unacceptable are what make it go viral in the first place. And so there's this kind of real tension here in which um, 
often things, yeah, that kind of can make content uh, really um, offensive or unacceptable to us are also uh, what are kind of fueling their popularity and uh, being promoted um, in many cases. Um, and this is a, this is an interesting essay because he he does this like really in depth dive on the um, Tide Pod challenge, uh, which was this meme around eating Tide Pods, which are poisonous. Do not eat them. And he uh, really analyzes it though, um, and it's, it's a great look at meme culture, which is very common. And how um, he kind of argues there's probably no example of someone talking about the Tide Pod challenge that isn't partially ironic, um, which is common in memes. That even kind of whatever you're saying. They're kind of layers of irony and different groups are interpreting them uh, differently and that even when you try to counteract them, you're still uh, promoting them. So with the Tide Pod Challenge, a lot of uh, like celebrities were telling people don't eat Tide Pods, but that was also then kind of perpetuating the, the popularity of this meme. Um, so it's, it's, it, this is a, an essay I would recommend that I think is pretty insightful. Um, and so this is, uh, we'll get to disinformation shortly, uh, but the, the major tech platforms often incentivize and promote disinformation, and this is unintentional, but it's, it is somewhat built into their design and architecture, their recommendation systems, and ultimately their business models. And then on the, on the topic of metrics, um, I just want to uh, bring up, uh, so there's this idea of uh, blitz scaling. And the premise is that if a company grows big enough and fast enough, profits will eventually follow. Um, it prioritizes speed over efficiency and risks potentially disastrous defeat. And Tim O'Reilly wrote a really great article uh, last year talking about many of the problems with this approach, um, which I would say is incredibly widespread and is, I would say, the fund uh, kind of fundamental model underlying a lot of venture capital. Um, and in it, though, investors kind of end up anointing winners as opposed to, to market forces. It tends to lend itself towards creating uh, monopolies and duopolies. Um, it can, uh, it's bad for founders and people end up kind of spreading themselves too thin. Um, so there are a number, number of uh, significant downsides to this. Um, why am I bringing this up in a, an ethics lesson? Uh, when we were talking about metrics. Um, but hockey, hockey stick growth requires automation and a reliance on metrics. Also, prioritizing speed above all else doesn't leave time to reflect on ethics. Um, and that is something that's hard that I think it, you do often have to kind of pause to, to think about ethics. Um, and that um, following this model, when you do have a problem, it's often going to show up on a huge scale if you've, if you've scaled very quickly. Um, so I think this is something to uh, at, least, at least be aware of. So one person asks about, um, is there a dichotomy between AI ethics, which seems like a very first world problem, and wars, poverty, environmental exploitation as being a kind of different level of problem, I guess. And uh, there's an answer here, which uh, somebody else maybe you can comment on with you agree or have anything to add, which is that um, AI ethics, they're saying, is very important also for other parts of the world, particularly in areas with high cell phone usage. For example, many countries in Africa have high cell penetration. People get their news from Facebook and WhatsApp and YouTube, and though it's useful, it's been the source of many problems. Do you have any comments on, on kind of... Yeah, that? so um, I think the first question, so AI ethics, as I noted earlier, um, uh, and I'm using the, the phrase data ethics here, but it's this very broad and it refers to a lot of things. Um, I think if people are talking about the, you know, in the future, can computers achieve sentience and what are the ethics around that? Um, and that is not my focus at all. Um, I am very much focused on, and this is our mission with the Center for Applied Data Ethics at the University of San Francisco, is kind of how are people being harmed now? What are the most immediate harms? Um, and so in that sense, um, I don't think that uh, data ethics has to be a, a first world or kind of futuristic issue. It's, it's what's happening now. Um, and yeah, and as, as the person said, and a few examples, um, well, one example I'll get to later is definitely uh, the, the genocide in Myanmar in which the um, uh, Muslim min minority, the Rohingya, um, are, are, are experiencing genocide. Um, the UN has uh, ruled that Facebook played a determining role in that, um, which is really... Uh, 
intense and terrible. Um, and so I think that's an example of technology, yeah, leading to very real harm now. Um, there are also, yeah, WhatsApp, which is owned by um, owned by Facebook. There have been issues with people spreading uh, disinformation and rumors, and it's led to um, several lynching dozens of lynchings in India of people kind of spreading these false rumors of, oh, there's a kidnapper coming around and in these kind of small remote villages, and then a visitor or stranger shows up and gets killed. Uh, uh, WhatsApp also played a very important role or bad role um, in the election of Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, election of Duerte in the Philippines. Um, so I think uh, uh, technology is having a kind of very uh, 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 immediate impact on on people, and that uh, those are the types of ethical questions I'm really interested in, and that I hope I hope you are interested in as well. Do you have anything else to say about that? Or, and I will I will talk about disinformation. I realize those were kind of some disinformation focus, and I, I'm going to talk about bias first. I think it's bias than disinformation. Yes. Question. Mm -hmm. When we talk about ethics, how much of this is intentional unethical behavior? I see a lot of the examples as more of incompetent behavior or bad modeling where the product or models are rushed without sufficient testing, thought around bias, so forth, but not necessarily malintent. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think that most of this is unintentional. Um, I do think there's a, a often, though, a, well, we'll get into some cases. I, I think that... I think that in many cases, the profit incentives are misaligned. And I do think uh, that when people are earning a lot of money, it is very hard to consider actions that would reduce their profits, um, even if they would um, prevent harm and, and increase kind of ethics. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, there's at some point where uh, valuing profit over how people are being harmed is um you know, when does when does that become intentional is, uh, is you know, a question to debate. But I, you know, I, yeah, I don't I don't think people are setting out to say, like, I want to cause a genocide or I want to help a authoritarian leader get elected. I, I, um, most people are not are not starting with that. But I think sometimes it's a, a carelessness and a thoughtlessness. Um, but that I I do think we are responsible for that. Um, and we're responsible to kind of be more careful and more thoughtful in how we approach things. All right, so bias. Um, so bias, I think, is a, an issue that's probably um, gotten a lot of attention, which is great. And I want to get a little bit more in depth because sometimes discussions on bias uh, stay a bit superficial. There was a great paper by Harini Suresh and John Gutag uh, last year uh, that looked at, that kind of came up with this taxonomy of different types of bias and how they had uh, kind of different sources in the uh, machine learning uh, kind of pipeline. Um, and it was really helpful because, you know, different sources have different causes and they also require different, uh, different approaches for addressing them. Uh, they, uh, Harini wrote a blog post version of the paper as well, which I love when researchers do that. I hope more of you, if you're writing an academic paper, also write the blog post version. Um, and I'm just going to go through a few of these types. So uh, one is representation bias. Um, and so I would imagine many of you have heard of uh, Joy Balamwini's work, uh, which has rightly received a lot of publicity uh, in Gender Shades. Uh, she and Timnit Gebru investigated commercial computer vision products from Microsoft, IBM, and Face++. And then uh, Joy Balamwini and Deb Raji did a follow-up study that looked at um, Amazon and Keros and several other companies. And the typical results they kind of found basically everywhere was that these products performed significantly worse on dark-skinned women. So they were uh, kind of doing uh, worse on people with darker skin compared to lighter skin, worse on women than on men. And then the kind of the intersection of that, dark-skinned women had these very high error rates. And so one uh, example is IBM. Uh, their product was 99.7% accurate on light-skinned men and only 65% accurate on dark-skinned women. And again, this is a commercial computer vision product that was released. Question? There's a question from the Trimmel study group about mm -hmm. the uh, Volkswagen example. Um, in many cases, it's management that drives and rewards unethical behavior. What can an individual engineer do in a case like this, especially in a place like Silicon Valley where people move companies so often? Yeah, so I think um, I think that's a great point. Yeah, and that is an example where I would have uh, I would have much rather seen people that were higher ranking uh, 
doing jail time about this uh, because I think that they were they were driving that. Um, I think that yeah, it's great to remember that. Um, I, I know many people in the world. Uh, uh, don't have this option, but I think for many of us working in tech, particularly in Silicon Valley, we tend to have a lot of options and often more options than we realize. Like I talk to people frequently that feel trapped in their jobs, um, even though, uh, you know, they're a software engineer in Silicon Valley and uh, and so many companies are hiring. Um, and so I think it is important to, to use that leverage. I think a lot of the uh, kind of employee organizing movements are very promising um, and that can be useful, but uh, really trying to... Um, kind of vet the, the ethics of the company you're joining and also being uh, willing to, to walk away if, you, if, um, um, if you're able to do so. That's a great, uh, great question. Um, so with this, this example of representation bias, um, here the uh, kind of way to address this is to build a more representative data set. Uh, it's very important to keep consent uh, in mind of the, the people, if, if you're using pictures of people, uh, but uh, uh, Joy Balamini and Tim Gebru did this as part of, as part of Gender Shades. Um, however, this is a, the fact that this was a problem not just for one company, but basically kind of every company they uh, uh, looked at um, was due to this underlying problem, which is that in machine learning, bench benchmark data sets spur on a lot of research. Um, however, kind of several years ago, all the kind of popular uh, facial data sets were primarily of light-skinned men, uh, for instance, IGBA, uh, uh, kind of popular face data set several years ago, only 4% of the images were of dark-skinned women. Yes? Uh, question. I've been worried about COVID-19 contact tracing and the erosion of privacy, location tracking, private surveillance companies, etc. What can we do to protect our digital rights post-COVID? Can we look to any examples in history of what to expect? Uh, that is um, that is a huge question and something I have been thinking about as well. I am I'm gonna um, put that off till later to talk about, and that is something where in the course I teach I have an entire uh, unit on privacy and surveillance, which I do not in tonight's lecture, but I can share some materials. Although I am already uh, really even just like rethinking how I'm gonna um, teach privacy and surveillance in the age of COVID nineteen. Uh, compared to two months ago when I, when I taught it the first time. Um, but that is something I think about a lot, and I will talk about uh, later if we have time or, um, or on the forums um, if, we, if we don't. But that's a, a great question, a very important question. Um, on the topic, and, and I will say, and I have not had the time to look into them yet, I do know that there are groups that are working on what are kind of more privacy protecting uh, um, approaches for, for tracking, and there are also groups putting out, uh, like if we are going to use some sort of uh, uh, tracking, what are the safeguards that need to be in place to do it responsibly? Yes? I've been looking at that too. Um, it does seem like this is a solvable problem with, with technology. Not all of these problems are, but um, you can certainly store a tracking history on somebody's cell phone. Um, and then you could have something where you say when you've been infected, and at that point you could tell people that they've been infected by sharing the location in a privacy-preserving way. So I think some people are trying to work on, on that. I'm not sure it's a particularly, particularly technically difficult problem. So I think that sometimes there are ways to provide the minimum kind of level of, you know, kind of application with, with, you know, whilst keeping privacy. Yeah, and, and I think it is very important to also have things of, you know, a clear, like, expiration date. Like we, you know, like looking back at 9-11 uh, in the United States that kind of ushered in all these laws that we're now kind of stuck with that have really eroded privacy of, of anything we do around COVID-19 being very clear. We are just doing this for COVID-19 and then in, there's a time limit and expires and it's kind of for this clear purpose. Um, and, and there are also issues, though, of, you know, I mentioned earlier about data containing errors. I know this has um, already been an issue in some of other countries that we're doing uh, uh, um, kind of more uh, surveillance focused approaches of, you know, what about like when it's wrong and people are getting kind of quarantined and they don't even know why and for no reason. Um, and so to, to be mindful of those. But yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about this uh, kind of later on. Uh, back to uh, back to bias. Um, 
Yeah, we had kind of the the benchmarks. Uh, so when when the benchmark uh, that's you know widely used has bias, then that is really kind of uh, uh, replicated at scale. And we're seeing this with ImageNet as well, which is you know probably the most uh, widely studied computer vision data set out there. Uh, Two thirds of the ImageNet images are from the West. Um, so this uh, pie chart shows that the uh, forty five percent of the images in ImageNet are from the United States. Seven percent from Great Britain. Six percent from Italy, three percent from Canada, three percent from Australia, you know, and we're covering a lot of uh, a lot of this pie without having uh, having gotten to uh, outside the West. Um, and so then this has shown up in concrete ways of uh, classifiers trained on ImageNet. So one of the categories is bridegroom, a, a man getting married. Um, there are a lot of, uh, you know, cultural components to that. And so they have, you know, much higher error rates on um, on bridegrooms from um, from the Middle East or, or from the global South, and there are there are people now kind of working to to diversify these data sets. Um, but it is quite dangerous that they can really uh, be kind of widely built on at scale or have been widely built on at scale before these biases were, were recognized. Another uh, case study um, is the compass recidivism algorithm, which is used in uh, determining who, uh, who has to pay bail. So in the U.S., a very large number of people are in prison who have not even had a trial yet just because they're too poor to afford bail, as well as sentencing decisions and parole decisions. Um, and ProPublica did a famous investigation in 2016 that I imagine many of you have heard of in which they um, found that the false positive rate for Black defendants uh, was nearly twice as high as for white defendants. Um, so black defendants who were late. A study from Dartmouth uh, found that it was the the software is no more accurate than Amazon Mechanical Turk workers, so random people on the internet. It's also uh, the software is you know this proprietary black box using over 130 inputs, and it's no more accurate than a linear classifier on three variables. Yet it's still in use, um, and it's in use in many states. Uh, Wisconsin is one place where it was challenged, yet the Wisconsin Supreme Court upheld its use. Uh, if you're interested in the uh, kind of topic of how you define fairness, because there is a lot of intricacy here, um, and I mean, I don't know anybody working on this who thinks that what Compass is doing is is right, but they're they're using this different different definition of fairness. Um, Arvin Ranyan has a fantastic tutorial, uh, Twenty One Fairness Definitions in Their Politics, that I that I highly recommend. And so, um, going back to kind of this ta taxonomy of types of bias, this is an example of historical bias. And historical bias is a fundamental structural issue with the first step of the data generation process, and it can exist even given perfect sampling and feature selection. So, um, kind of with the, the image classifier, that was something where we could, you know, go gather a more representative set of images, and that would help address it. That is not the case here. Um, so, gathering kind of uh, more data on uh, the U.S. criminal justice system, it's all going to be biased because that's really kind of baked into baked into our history and our, our current state. Um, and so this is, I think, good, good to recognize. Um, uh, one thing that can be done to um, try to at least mitigate this is to, to really talk to domain experts and by the people impacted. And so a really positive example of this is a, um, a, a tech a tutorial from the Fairness Accountability and Transparency Conference that Christian Lum, who's the lead statistician for the Human Rights Data Analysis Group and now a professor at UPenn, organized together with a former public defender, Elizabeth Bender, um, who's the staff attorney for uh, New York's Legal Aid Society, and Terrence Wilkerson, an innocent man who was arrested and could not afford bail. And Elizabeth and Terrence were able to provide a lot of insight to how the criminal justice system works in practice, which is often uh, kind of very different from the you know more kind of clean logical abstractions that that computer scientists deal with um, but it's really important to understand those kind of intricacies of how this is going to be implemented and used in these you know messy complicated real world systems question aren't the AI biases transferred from real life biases for instance how are people being treated differently is an everyday phenomenon, women too. Uh, that's correct, yes. Um, so this is often, yeah, coming from, from real world biases.
and I'll, I'll come to this in a moment, um, but uh, algorithmic systems can amplify those biases, so they can make them even worse. But uh, yeah, they are often being learned from, uh, from existing data. I, I asked it because I guess I often see this being raised as if it's kind of a reason not to worry about AI. It's oh. Like, oh, it's not. Well, AI. I'm, I'm going to get to that in a moment, um, actually. I think in two slides, so hold on to that question. Um, I just want to talk about one other type of bias first, uh, measurement bias. Um, so this was an interesting paper by Sandil Malanathan and Zayed Obermeyer, where they looked at historic um, electronic health record data to try to determine what factors are most predictive of stroke. And they said, you know, this could be useful, like prioritizing patients at the ER. And so they found that the number one most predictive factor was prior stroke, which that makes sense. Second was cardiovascular disease. That's also, that seems reasonable. And then third most, uh, kind of still very predictive factor, was accidental injury, followed by having a benign breast lump, a colonoscopy, or sinusitis. And so I'm not a medical doctor, but I can tell something weird's going on with uh, factors three through six here. Like, why would these things be uh, predictive of, of stroke? Does anyone want to think about, about why this might be? Any guesses you want to read? No, I mean, there's, oh. like, there's lots of things. Oh, someone's, yeah. <laughs> Okay, the first answer was they test for it anytime someone has stroke. Confirmation bias, overfitting, is it because they happen to be in hospital already? Biased data, EHR records these events. Because the data was taken before certain advances in medical science. These are these are all good guesses, not not quite uh, what I was looking for, uh, but Good, good thinking. That's such a nice it's, way of saying. No. <laughs> um, so what the what the researchers say here is that um, this was about uh, their patients, uh, their people that utilize healthcare a lot, and people that don't, and they call it kind of high utility versus low utility of healthcare. And there are a lot of factors that go into this. I'm sure just who has health insurance and who can afford their copays. There may be cultural factors. There may be racial and gender bias. Or there is racial and gender bias on on how people are treated. Um, so a lot of factors, and basically, uh, people that utilize healthcare a lot, they will go to a doctor when they have sinusitis, and they will also go in when they're having a stroke. And people that do not utilize healthcare much are probably not going to go in, um, possibly for either. And so, um, so what the authors write is that we haven't measured stroke, which is you know a region of the brain being denied uh, kind of new blood and new oxygen. What we've measured is who had symptoms, who went to the doctor, received tests, and then got this diagnosis of stroke. And you know that seems like it might be a reasonable proxy for for who had a stroke, um, but a proxy is you know never exactly what you wanted, and in many cases that that gap ends up being uh, significant. And so this is just one form that that measurement bias can take. But I think it's Thing to really uh, kind of be on the lookout for because it can be quite subtle. And so now starting to return to a point that was brought up earlier, um, aren't, aren't people biased? Um, yes, yes we are. And so um, there have been dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of studies on this, um, but I'm just going to quote a few, all of which are linked to in this uh, Sandil Malanathan New York Times article, if you want to find, uh, find the studies. So this all comes from, you know, peer-reviewed research. Uh, but when doctors were shown identical files, uh, they were much less likely to recommend a helpful cardiac procedure to black patients compared to white patients. And so that was, you know, same file, but just changing the race of the patient. When bargaining for a used car, uh, black people were offered initial prices $700 higher and received fewer concessions. Responding to apartment rental ads on Craigslist with a black name elicited fewer responses than with a white name. An all-white jury was 16 points more likely to convict a black defendant than a white one, but when a jury had just one black member, it convicted both at the same rate. Um, and so I share these to show that kind of no matter what type of data you're looking, working on, whether that is medical data or sales data or housing data or criminal justice data, um, that it's very likely that there's, there's bias in it. There's a question. No, I was just going to say, I find that last mm -hmm. one really interesting, like this kind of idea that a single black member of a jury, I guess it has some kind of like anchoring impact. It kind of suggests that, you know, I'm sure you're going to talk about diversity later, but I just want to keep this in mind that maybe mm. like, 
even a tiny bit of diversity here just reminds people that there's a, a you know a range of different types of people and perspectives. No, that's a that's a great point. Yeah. And so the, the question that was uh, kind of asked earlier is, so why does algorithmic bias matter? Like I have just shown you that humans are really biased too. So why are, uh, why are we talking about algorithmic bias? And people have brought this up, kind of like, what's, what's the fuss about it? Um, and there, I, I think algorithmic bias is uh, very significant and worth talking about. And I'm going to share uh, four reasons uh, for that. Um, one is that machine learning can amplify bias. Um, so it's not just encoding existing biases, but in some cases it's making them worse. Um, there have been a few studies on this. Uh, one I like is um, from Maria de Artiga of uh, CMU. And here they were, uh, they took uh, people's, I think, uh, job descriptions from LinkedIn. And what they found is that imbalances ended up being compounded. And so in the group of surgeons, um, only 14% were women. However, in the true positives, so they were trying to predict the, the job title from the, the summary, uh, women were only 11% in the true positives. Um, so this kind of imbalance has gotten worse. And basically there was kind of this asymmetry where the, uh, you know, the algorithm has learned it's safer uh, for for women to kind of not, not guess surgeon. Another, so this is uh, one reason, uh, another reason that uh, algorithmic bias is a concern is that algorithms are used very differently than human decision makers in practice. And so people sometimes talk about them as though they are plug and play interchangeable of, you know, if a human's this bias and the algorithm is, you know, this bias, why don't we just substitute it in? Um, however, the, the whole system around it ends up kind of being different in, in practice. Uh, one, one kind of aspect of this is people are more likely to assume algorithms are objective or error free, even if they're given the option of a human override. And so if you give a person, you know, even if you just say, hey, I'm just giving the judge this recommendation, they don't have to follow it. If it's coming from a computer, many people are going to take that as objective. In some cases, also, there may be, you know, pressure from their boss to, you know, not disagree with the computer more times, you know, nobody's going to get fired by going with the computer recommendation. Algorithms are more likely to be implemented with no appeals process in place. And so we saw that earlier when we were talking about recourse. Algorithms are often used at scale. They can be replicating an identical bias at scale. And algorithmic systems are cheap. And all of these, I think, are interconnected. Um, so in many cases, um, I think that algorithmic systems are being implemented not because they produce better outcomes for everyone, but because um, they're kind of a cheaper way to do things at scale. You know, offering a recourse process is more expensive. Being on the lookout for errors is more expensive. So this is kind of um, cost-cutting measures. And Kathy O'Neill talks about many of these themes in her book, Weapons of Math Destruction, um, kind of under the idea that the, the privileged are processed by people, the poor are processed by algorithms. There's a question. Two questions. Mm -hmm. This seems like an intensely deep topic, needing specialized expertise to avoid getting it wrong. If you were building an ML product, would you approach an academic institution for consultation on this? Do you see a data product development triad becoming maybe a quartet involving an ethics or data privacy expert? Um. So I think interdisciplinary work is very important. Um, I would. I would definitely uh, focus on trying to find kind of domain experts on whatever your particular domain is who understand the intricacies of that domain um, is important. Um, and I think with the, kind of with the academic, it depends. You do want to make sure you get someone who's kind of applied enough to uh, kind of understand how, um, how things are happening in, in industry. But yeah, I think involving more people and people from more fields is, uh, is a, good, a good approach on the whole. Someone invents and publishes a better ML technique, like attention or transformers, and then next a graduate student demonstrates using it to improve facial recognition by 5%, and then a small startup publishes an app that does better facial recognition, and then a government uses the app to study downtown walking patterns and endangered species, and after these successes for court audit monitoring, and then a repressive government then takes that method to identify ethnicities, and then you get a genocide. No one's made a huge ethical error at any incremental step, yet the result is horrific. I have no doubt that Amazon will soon serve up a personally customized price for each item that maximizes their profits. How can such ethical creep be addressed where the effect is remote from many 
small causes. Um, so, yeah, so that that's a, a kind of a great summary of how, yeah, these things can happen somewhat incrementally. Um, I'll talk about some tools to implement um, it, kind of uh, towards the end of this lesson that hopefully can help us. Um, so some of it is I think we do need to get better at kind of trying to think a few more steps ahead than we have been. Um, you know, in particular, we've seen examples of people, um, you know, there was the study of how to identify protesters in a crowd, even when they had scarves or sunglasses or hats on, you know, and when the, the researchers on that were questioned, it, they were like, oh, it never even occurred to us that bad guys would use this. You know, we just thought it would be uh, for finding bad people. Um, and so I do think uh, kind of everyone should be uh, building their uh ability to, to think a few more steps ahead. And, and part of this is like, it's great to do this in teams, preferably in diverse teams, um, can help with that that process. Um, I mean, on this question of computer vision, there has been, you know, just in the last few months, um, uh, is it Joe Redman, uh, creator of YOLO, who has said that he's no longer working on computer vision just because he thinks the, the um, misuses so far um, outweigh the, the positives. Um, and Timnit Gebru said she's she's considering that as well. Um, so I think there are, there are times where you ha you have to consider. Um, and then I think also really actively thinking about how to what safeguards do we need to put in place to kind of address the the misuses that are happening. Yes. I just wanted to say somebody really liked the Kathy O'Neill quote: "Privileged are processed by people; the poor processed by algorithms." And they're looking forward to learning more, reading more from Kathy O'Neill. Is that a book that you recommend? Yes, yeah. And and, and Kathy O'Neill also uh, writes, uh, and, and Kathy O'Neill is a fe fellow uh, fellow math PhD, um, uh, but she also has yeah written a number of good articles. Um, and it, it, the, the book kind of goes through a number of, uh, of case studies of how algorithms are being used in, in different places. Um, so kind of um, in, in summary of humans are biased, why, do, why are we making a fuss about algorithmic bias? Um, so one, as we saw earlier, machine learning can create feedback loops. So it's, you know, it's not just um, kind of observing what's happening in the world, but it's also determining outcomes and it's kind of determining what future data is. Machine learning can amplify bias. Algorithms and humans are used very differently in practice. And then I'll also say technology is power. Um, and with that comes responsibility. And I think for, for all of us to, to have access to deep learning, we are still in a kind of very uh, fortunate and small percentage of the world that uh, is, is able to use this technology right now. And I hope, um, I hope we will all use it responsibly and really take our, our, our power seriously. Um, and I just, uh, I just noticed the time, and I think we're about to start um, a next section on, on analyzing or um, kind of steps, uh, steps we can take. So this would be a good, a good place to take a break. So uh, let's meet back in I guess, seven minutes at uh, 7.45. All right, let's start back up. And actually, I was at a slightly different place than I thought. Um, but just a, a few uh, questions that, uh, that you can ask about projects you're working on, and I, I hope you will ask about projects you're working on. Um, the first is, uh, should, we, should we even be doing this? Um, and considering uh, that maybe there's some work that we, we shouldn't do. Uh, uh, there's a paper when the implication is not to design technology. Um, as engineers, we often tend to respond to problems with, you know, what can I make or build to, to address this? But sometimes the answer is to not uh, make or build anything. Um, uh, uh, one example of research that I think has huge amount of downside and really no upside I see was um, kind of to identify the ethnicity, um, particularly for people of ethnic minorities. Um, and so there was work done identifying the Chinese Uyghurs, which is the Muslim minority in Western China, which has since, um, you know, over a million people have been placed in internment camps. Um, and so I think this is a very, uh, very harmful, harmful line of research. Um, I think that the uh, uh, you know, there have been at least two attempts of building uh, building a classifier to try to identify uh, someone's sexuality, which is, uh, it's probably just picking up on kind of stylistic differences, but this is something that could also be quite quite dangerous, as in many countries it's, it's illegal um, to be gay. Yes? So this is a question for me, which mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to. Yeah. Um, as that title says, a Stanford scientist says he built the gaydar 
using the lamest AI possible to prove a point. And my understanding is that point was to say, you know, I guess it's something like, hey, you could use fast AI lesson one. After an hour or two, you can build this thing. Anybody can do it. You know, how, how do you feel about this idea that there's a role to demonstrate what's readily available with the technology we have? Yeah, I mean, that's something that I think... Um so I, I appreciate that, uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, OpenAI with GPT-2, I think, was trying to raise a, uh, uh, raise a debate around, uh, around dual use and what is responsible release of, of dual use technology and what's a kind of responsible way to, to raise, uh, uh, raise awareness of what is possible. Um, in, the, in the cases of researchers that have, uh, have done this on the sexuality question, uh, to me, it hasn't seemed like they've put adequate thought into how they're conducting that and who they're collaborating with to ensure that it is something that um, is leading to kind of helping address the problem. Um, um, but I think you're right that I think there is probably some place for letting people yeah, know what is probably widely available now. Yeah, it reminds me a bit of like pen testing in, in InfoSec yeah. where, where it's kind of considered it. Well, there's an ethical way that you can go about pointing out that it's trivially easy to break yes, into somebody's yeah. system. Yes. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that, that there, there is an ethical way. But I think that's something that uh, we as a community uh, still have more work to do and even determining what that is. Um, other questions to consider are uh, what bias is in the data and something I should highlight is uh, people often ask me, you know, how can I de-bias my data or ensure that it's bias free? Um, and that's not possible. All data contains bias. And the uh, kind of most uh, most important thing is just to understand kind of how your data set was created and what its limitations are so that you're not blindsided by that bias, but you're never going to fully remove it. And some of the, I think, most promising approaches in this area are um, uh, work like Timnit Gebru's data sheets for data sets, which is kind of going through and asking um, kind of a bunch of questions about how your data set was created and for what purposes and how it's being maintained and, you know, what are the risks in that just to, uh, to really kind of be aware of, of the context of your data. Uh, can the code and data be audited? I think particularly in the United States, we have a lot of issues with uh, when private companies are uh, creating software that's really impacting people through the criminal justice system or hiring. Um, and when these things are, you know, kind of their proprietary black boxes that are protected in court, um, that's, this creates a lot of kind of, a, of issues of, you know, what are, what are our rights um, around that. Uh, looking at error rates for different subgroups is really important, and that's what's so, uh, kind of so powerful about Joy Balamwini's work. If she had just looked at uh, light skin versus dark skin and men versus women, she wouldn't have identified just how uh, poorly the algorithms were doing on dark-skinned women. What is the accuracy of a simple rule-based alternative? Um, and this is something I think Jeremy talked about last week, which is uh, just kind of good, good machine learning practice uh, to, to have a baseline. Um, but particularly in cases like the compass recidivism, where this 130 variable black box is not doing much better than a linear classifier on three variables, um, that raises kind of a question of why are, why are we using this? And then what processes are in place to handle appeals or mistakes? Uh, because there will be errors in the data, there may be bugs in the implementation, um, and we need to have a, a process for recourse. Yes? Can you explain, this is for me now? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm asking my own questions. <laughs> Nobody fine. voted them up at all. Um, what's the thinking behind this idea that a simpler model, is, is, is you're kind of saying a simpler model or the other things being the same, you should pick the simpler one? Is that what this baseline's for? What and, and if so, what's the kind of thinking behind that? Um, well, I, I, okay. So I guess with the the compass recidivism algorithm, some of this for me is linked to the proprietary black box nature. And so you're right. If maybe if we had a way to introspect and what were our rights around appealing something, um, but I would say yeah. Like why use the more complex thing if the the simpler one works uh, the same. Um, and then how diverse is the team that built it? And I'll talk more about team diversity uh, later uh, later in this lesson. It says Jeremy at the start, but I'm not the teacher. So it actually says, Jeremy, do you think transfer learning makes this tougher 
auditing the data that led to the initial model. I assume they mean Jeremy, please ask Rachel. No, they were they were asking you. <laughs> um, that's no, that's a good question. Um, again, I think it's important. I would I would say I think it's important to have information probably on both data sets, uh, what the initial data set used was, and uh, what the the data set you used to fine tune it. Do you have thoughts on that? What she said. <laughs> Um, and then I'll say, so uh, while uh, bias and fairness, as well as accountability and transparency are important, um, they aren't everything. Um, and so there's this great paper, a mulching proposal um, by Oz Keys et al. And um, here they talk about a system for turning the elderly into high nutrient slurry. So this is something that's clearly unethical, but they uh, propose a way to do it that is fair and accountable and transparent and uh, meets these qualifications. And so that uh, kind of shows uh, some of the limitations of this framework, as well as kind of being a good, uh, a good technique for um, uh, kind of inspecting uh, whatever framework you are using of trying to find something that's clearly unethical that could that could meet uh, meet the standards you've put forth. That that technique, I really like it. It's like a it's my favorite technique from philosophy. It's this idea that you you say, okay, given this premise, here's what it implies, and then you try and find an implied result which intuitively is clearly insane. And it's a really it's it's yeah, it's the number one philosophical thinking tool I got out of university and I, I, sometimes you can have a lot of fun with it like this time too. Oh, thank you. All right, so the next kind of big uh, case study or topic I want to discuss is disinformation. Um, so in uh, 2016 in um, Houston, a, a group called Heart of Texas uh, posted about a, a, a protest outside an Islamic center. And they told people to come armed. A, another Facebook group uh, posted about a counter protest uh, to show up uh, supporting freedom of religion and um, inclusivity. And so there were kind of a lot of people uh, present at this, um, more people on the, the side uh, supporting freedom of religion. Um, and a reporter, though, for the Houston Chronicle noticed something odd, which he was not able to get in touch with the organizers for either side. And it came out uh, many months later that both sides had been organized by Russian trolls. Um, and so this is something where you had uh, the people protesting were, you know, genuine Americans uh, kind of protesting their beliefs, but they were doing it in this uh, way that had been kind of completely framed very disingenuously uh, by, by Russian operatives. And so when thinking about disinformation, um, it is not, uh, people often think about um, so-called fake news, you know, and inspecting like a single post, is this, you know, is this true or false? Um, but really disinformation is often about orchestrated campaigns of manipulation um, and that it involves, uh, can involve uh, seeds of, of, of truth, you know, kind of the best propaganda always involves kernels of truth. At least um, it also involves a kind of misleading context and, and, can, and can involve very kind of sincere, uh, sincere people that get, get swept up in it. A, a report came out uh, this fall, an investigation from Stanford's Internet Observatory, uh, where Rene DiResta and Alex Stamos work of uh, Russia's uh, kind of most recent uh, disinformation or most recently identified disinformation campaign. Um, and it was operating in six different countries in Africa. Um, it often purported to be local news sources. Um, it was multi-platform. They were encouraging people to join their WhatsApp and Telegram groups. Um, and they were um, hiring local people as reporters. And a lot, a lot of the content was uh, not uh, not necessarily disinformation. It was stuff on culture and sports and local weather. Um, I mean, there was a lot of uh, kind of very uh, pro pro Russia coverage, um, but that it covered a range of topics. And so this is kind of a very uh, sophisticated phase of disinformation. And um, in many cases, it was hiring hiring locals um, kind of as reporters uh, to to work for these sites. Um, and I, I should say, well, I've just given two examples of Russia. Russia does, certainly does not have a monopoly on disinformation. There are uh, uh, plenty of uh, 
plenty of people involved in producing it. Um, uh, kind of on a topical uh, uh, topical uh, issue, there's been a lot of disinformation around um, around coronavirus and COVID nineteen. Um, I. In terms of kind of a personal level, if you're looking for advice on spotting disinformation or to, to share with loved ones about this, uh, Mike Caulfield is a, a great person uh, to follow. And he's even, uh, so he tweets at Holden and then he has started an infodemic blog specifically about the about COVID-19. Uh, but he, he talks about his approach and how people have been trained in schools for 12 years. Here's a text, read it, use your critical thinking skills to figure out what you think about it. But professional fact checkers do the opposite. They get to a page and they immediately get off of it and look for kind of higher uh, higher quality sources to see if they can find confirmation. Um, uh, Caulfield also really promotes the idea of a lot of uh, critical thinking techniques that have been taught uh, take a long time. And, you know, we're not going to spend 30 minutes evaluating each tweet that we see in our Twitter stream. It's better to give people an approach that they can do in 30 seconds that, you know, it's not going to be fail proof if you're just doing something for 30 seconds, but it's better to to check than to have something that takes 30 minutes that you're just not going to do at all. Um, so I wanted to kind of put this out there as a, as a resource. Um, and he has a whole kind of set of uh, lessons at lessons.checkplease.cc. And he's a, he's a professor. Um, and I, uh, in the uh, data ethics course I'm teaching right now, um, I made my first lesson, the first half of which is uh, kind of specifically about coronavirus uh, disinformation. Um, I've made that available on YouTube. I've already shared it. And so I'll, I'll add a link uh, on the forums. Um, if you want, if you want a lot more detail on on disinformation than just kind of this uh, this short bit here, um, but so so going back to kind of like what is disinformation, um, it's important to to think of it as an ecosystem. Again, it's not just a, a single post or a single news story that has uh, you know is misleading or has false elements in it, but it's it's really this broader ecosystem. Claire Wardle, uh, uh, First Draft News, who is a, a leading expert on this and does a lot around kind of uh, training journalists and how journalists can report responsibly, talks about the trumpet of amplification. And this is where um, I, rumors or uh, memes or things can start on 4chan and 8chan and then move to closed messaging groups um, such as WhatsApp, Telegram, Facebook Messenger, from there to com communi uh, conspiracy communities on Reddit or YouTube, then to kind of more mainstream social media and then uh, picked up by the professional media and politicians. And so this can make it very hard to address that it is this kind of multi-platform. In many cases, uh, campaigns may be uh, utilizing kind of the differing rules or loopholes between, between the different platforms. Um, and I think we certainly are seeing more and more examples where it doesn't have to go through all these steps, but can, can, uh, can jump, uh, jump forward. Um, and online discussion is very, uh, very significant because people, uh, it helps us form our opinions. And, and, and this is tough because I think most of us think of ourselves as pretty independent minded, but um, discussion really does, you know, we evolved as kind of social beings and to be influenced by, by people in our in-group and in opposition to people in our out-group. And so online discussion impacts us. Um, people discuss all sorts of things online. Here's a Reddit discussion about whether the US should cut defense spending. Um, you have comments, you're wrong. The defense budget is a good example of how badly the US spends money on the mil military. Um, someone else says, yeah, but that's already happening. There's a huge increase in the military budget. The Pentagon budget's already increasing. Uh, I didn't mean to stop, sound like stop paying for the military. I'm not saying that we cannot pay the bills, but I think it would make sense to cut defense spending. Um, does anyone want to guess what subreddit this is from? Okay. Oh. Unpopular opinion, news, change my view, net neutrality. Okay. Um, those are good guesses, but they're wrong. I love the way you say no. <laughs> um, this is all from, well, it is, um, it's from the um, G, uh, sub simulator GPT-2. So these comments were all um, written by GPT-2. Um, and this is in good fun. It was uh, clearly labeled on the subre subreddit uh, that it's coming. And GPT-2 is a, a language model from OpenAI uh, that was kind of in a, um, a, a, a trajectory of research that many, many groups were on. Um, 
And so it was uh, released, I guess, about a year ago. And should I read the unicorn story, Jeremy? Okay, so if, um, many of you have probably have probably seen this. Um, so here, uh, and, and this this was cherry picked, but this is still very very impressive. Uh, so a human written prompt was given to the the language model. In a shocking finding, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley in the Andes Mountains. Even more surprising to the researchers was the fact that the unicorns spoke perfect English. And then the next part uh, is all uh, generated by the language model. So this is a deep learning model that produced this, um, and the, the computer model uh, generated Dr. Jorge Perez and had what appeared to be a natural fountain surrounded by two peaks of rock and silver snow. Perez and the others then ventured further into the valley. By the time we reached the top of one peak, the water looked blue with some crystals on top, said Perez. Perez and his friends were astonished to see the unicorn herd. These creatures could be seen from the air without having to move too much to see them. They were so close they could touch their horns. While examining these bizarre creatures, the scientists discovered that the creatures also spoke some fairly regular English. Perez stated, we can see, for example, that they have a common language, something like a dialect or dialectic. Um, and so I think this is really um, compelling prose to have been, have been generated by a computer um, in this form. So we've also uh, seen advances in computers uh, generating pictures, uh, specifically GANs. Um, so Katie Jones was listed on LinkedIn as a Russia and Eurasia fellow. She was connected to several people from mainstream Washington think tanks. And the Associated Press discovered that she is not a real person. This photo was generated by a GAN. And so this, I think, gets um, kind of scary when we start thinking about how um, how compelling the text that's being generated is and combining that with uh, pictures. These photos are all from this person does not exist uh, dot com generated by GANs. Um, and, and there's a, a very, uh, very uh, real and eminent risk that online discussion will be swamped with fake manipulative agents. Um, to an even greater extent than it, than it already has, and that this, this can be used to, to influence public opinion. So, oh, actually, I guess, it, well, no, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, going back in time to 2017, the FCC was considering repealing net neutrality, and so they opened up for comments to see, you know, how do Americans feel about net neutrality? And this is a sample of many of the comments that were opposed to net neutrality. They wanted to repeal it, um, and it included, I'll just read a few clips. Uh, Americans, as opposed to Washington bureaucrats, deserve to enjoy the services they desire. Individual citizens, as opposed to Washington bureaucrats, should be able to select whichever services they desire. People like me, as opposed to so-called experts, should be free to buy whatever products they choose. Um, and these have been helpfully color-coded, so you can kind of see a pattern that this was a bit of a, a Mad Libs, uh, where you had a few choices for green for the first uh, noun, uh, and then in uh, orange or, or red, I guess it's as opposed to or rather than. Uh, orange, we've got either Washington bureaucrats, so-called experts, the FCC, um, and so on. And this, uh, this analysis was done by Jeff Cow, who's now a computational journalist at ProPublica doing uh, great work. Um, and he did uh, this analysis um, discovering uh, this, uh, uh, this campaign in which uh, these comments were designed to look unique, but had been created kind of through, uh, through some mail merge style, uh, kind of putting together a, a Mad Libs. Yes? Um, so this was this was great work by uh, Jeff. Um, he found that so while uh, they received the, so the FCC received over 22 million comments, um, less than four percent of them were truly unique. And this is uh, this is not all uh, malicious activity. You know there are many uh, kind of ways where you get a template to contact your legislator about something, um, but. You know, in the example kind of shown previously, these were designed to look like they were unique when they weren't. Um, and more than 99% of the truly unique comments wanted to keep net neutrality. However, that was not uh, not the case if you looked at the full the full 22 million comments. 
Um, however, this was this was in 2017, which may not sound that long ago, but um, in in the field of natural language processing, we've had like an entire kind of a revolution since then. There's just been so much progress made. And this would be, I think, virtually impossible to catch today um, using, a, you know, if someone was using a sophisticated language model to, to generate comments. So Jess asks a question, which I'm going to treat it as a two-part question, even okay. if it's not necessarily. What happens when there's so much AI trolling that most of what gets traped from the web is AI-generated text? Mm. And then the second part, and then what happens when you use that to generate more AI-generated text? Yeah, so for the first part, um, yeah, this is a real risk, uh, or not risk, but kind of challenge we're facing of uh, real humans can get drowned out uh, when uh, so much text is going gonna, is gonna to be um, AI trolling. Um, and, and we're already seeing, and I, in the interest of time, I have... I can talk about disinformation for hours, and I had to cut a lot of stuff out. Um, but uh, um, many people have talked about how kind of the the new form of censorship is about drowning people out, and so it's not necessarily kind of forbidding someone from saying something, but just totally, uh, totally just drowning them out with a, a massive quantity of of text and information and comments and AI can really facilitate that and so I do not have a good solution to that. Um, in, in terms of AI learning from AI uh, text, I mean I think you're going to get systems that are potentially kind of less and less relevant to humans and may have harmful effects if they're uh, kind of being used to create software that is um, interacting with or impacting humans. Um, so that's uh, a concern. I mean, one of the things I find fascinating about this is we could get to a point where 99.99% .99 of tweets and fast AI forum posts <laughs> and whatever are auto-generated, particularly on kind of more like political type places where a lot of it's pretty low content, pretty yeah. basic. Um, and the thing is like, if it was actually good, you wouldn't even know. So what if I told you that 75% of the people you're talking to on the forum right now are actually bots? How can you tell <laughs> which ones they are? <laughs> How would you prove whether I'm right or wrong? Yeah, no, and I, I think this is a real issue on Twitter of, you know, particularly people you don't know of, you know, wondering like, is this an actual person or a bot? Um, I think is a common question people, people wonder about um, and can be hard to tell. But I, I think it um, has significance for, um, has a lot of significance for kind of how human government works. You know, I think there's something about humans uh, being in society and having norms and rules and mechanisms um, that this can really um, undermine and make difficult. Um, and so when, uh, uh, when GP2, Two came out. Uh, Jeremy Howard, co-founder of FastAI, was quoted um, in in uh, the Verge article on it. I've been trying to warn people about this for a while. We have the technology to totally fill Twitter, email, and the web up with reasonable-sounding, context-appropriate prose, which would drown out all other speech and be impossible to filter. Uh, so one uh, uh, kind of um, step towards addressing this. Um, is the need for uh, digital signatures. Oren Etziani, the head of the Allen Institute on AI, uh, wrote about this in HBR. Um, he wrote, recent developments in AI point to an age where forgery of documents, pictures, audio recordings, videos, and online identities will occur with unprecedented ease. AI is poised to make high fidelity forgery inexpensive and automated, leading to potentially disastrous consequences for democracy, security, and society. Um, and proposes kind of digital signatures um, as a means for authentication. Um, and I will say here, uh, kind of one of the one of the additional risk of kind of um, uh, 
uh, all this forgery and fakes is that it also um, undermines people speaking the truth. And uh, Zainab Tefekci, who uh, does a lot of research on um, uh, protests around the world and uh, in different social movements, um, has said that she's often um, approached by kind of uh, whistleblowers and dissidents who in many cases will risk their lives to try to uh, publicize like a wrongdoing or human rights violation only to have uh, uh, kind of bad actors say, oh, that picture was photoshopped, that was faked, and that it's kind of now this big issue for uh, for whistleblowers and dissidents of how how can they verify what they are saying and that kind of that need uh, uh, need for verification. Um, and then uh, uh, someone you should definitely be following on this topic is Renee DiResta. Um, and and she wrote a great article with Mike Godwin last year, um, framing that we really need to think disinformation as uh, as a cybersecurity problem. Um, you know, it's these kind of coordinated campaigns of manipulation um, and bad actors. And there's, um, I think, some uh, important work happening at, at Stanford as well on this. All right, questions on disinformation. Okay, so uh, next step, uh, ethical foundations. Uh, so now, so the fast AI approach, we always like to kind of ground everything and what are the real world case studies before we get to kind of the, the, the theory underpinning it. And I'm, I'm not gonna go, go too deep on this at all. Um, so there is a fun article, what would an Avenger do? Um, and hat tip to Casey Fiesler uh, for suggesting this. Um, and it goes through uh, kind of three common ethical philosophies, uh, uh, utilitarianism, and gives the example of Iron Man, um, trying to maximize good, uh, deontological ethics of uh, Captain America being an example of this, adhering to the right, and then virtue ethics, Thor living by a code of honor. Um, and so I thought that was a nice reading. Yes? Um. Where do you stand on the argument that social media companies are just neutral platforms and that problematic content is the entire responsibility of the users, just the same way that phone companies aren't held responsible when phones are used for scams or car companies held responsible when vehicles are used for, say, terrorist attacks? Um, so I do not think that... Uh the pl uh, that the platforms are neutral because they make a number of uh, design decisions and enforcement decisions around even kind of what their what their terms of service are and how those are enforced um, and that in keeping in mind um, harassment can drive many people off of platforms and so uh, kind of uh, many of those decisions it's not that oh everybody gets to keep free speech when there's no enforcement it's uh it's just changing kind of who 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 is silenced um i do think that there are a lot of really difficult questions that are raised about this um because uh, i also i think that the the platforms you know it's they are they are not publishers but they are in this i think kind of a intermediate uh area where they're performing many of the functions that uh, publishers used to perform. Um, so, you know, like a newspaper, which, which is curating which, which articles are in it, um, which is not what platforms are doing, but they are uh, getting closer, uh, closer to that. Um, I mean, I, I, something I come back to is it is, it is an uncomfortable amount of power um, for, for private companies to have. Yeah. Um, and so it does raise a lot of difficult decisions, but I, I do not believe that they are, they are neutral. So um, for, for this part, I mentioned the Marcula Center earlier. Definitely check out their site, uh, Ethics and Technology Practice. They have a lot of useful, uh, uh, useful resources. And I'm going to go through these uh, relatively quickly as just kind of examples. Um, so they give some kind of deontological questions that technologists could ask. And so deonto uh, deontological ethics are where you kind of have various um, uh, um, kind of rights or uh, duties that you might want to respect. And this can include uh, principles like uh, privacy or autonomy. Um, how might the dignity and autonomy of each stakeholder be impacted by this project? What considerations of trust and of justice are relevant? 
Uh, does the sim project involve any conflicting moral duties to others? Um, in some cases, you know, there'll be a kind of conflict between different uh, uh, different rights or duties you're considering. Um, and so this is this is kind of an example, and they have more uh, more in the reading of the types of questions you could be asking, um, kind of when evaluating of just even how do you evaluate uh, kind of whether whether a project uh, is ethical. Consequentialist questions. Um, who will be directly affected? Who will be indirectly affected? Uh, will the and consequentialist um, includes uh, utilitarianism as well as common good. Um, will the effects in aggregate uh, create more good than harm? And what types of good and harm? Are you thinking about all the relevant types of harm and benefit, including psychological, political, environmental, moral, cognitive, emotional, institutional, cultural? Also looking at long-term, uh, long-term benefits and harms. Um, and then who experiences them? Is this something where the risk of the harm are gonna fall disproportionately on the least powerful? Who, who's gonna be the ones uh, to accrue the benefits? Um, have you considered dual use? Um, and so these are, these are again, kind of uh, questions you could use when trying to, trying to evaluate a project. And I think, and, and the recommendation of the Marcula Center is that this is um, a great activity to kind of to be doing as a team and as a group. I was going to say, like, I, I, can't, um, I can't overstate how useful this tool is. Like, it, you might think, oh, it's just a list of questions, yeah, you know. But, like, this is kind of, to me, this is the, this is the, the big gun tool for, for, how you, for how you handle this. Is like, if somebody is helping you think about the right set of questions, and then you, like, go through them with a diverse group of people and discuss the questions, I mean, that's that it's, this is this is gold like don't you know go back and reread these and don't don't just skip over them because um, take take them to work use them next time you're talking about a project they they're a really great great set of questions to use a great tool in your toolbox yeah and go to the the original reading has even kind of more detail and um, uh, more elaboration on on the questions um, and then they kind of give a, a summary of uh, five potential ethical lenses uh, the, the rights approach, uh, which option best respects the rights of all who have a stake. The justice approach, which option treats people equally or proportionally. And so these two are both uh, uh, deontological. Uh, the utilitarian approach, uh, which option will produce the most good and do the least harm. The common good approach, which option best serves the community as a whole, not just the members. And uh, so here three and four are both uh, uh, consequentialist and then uh, virtue approach which option leads me to act as the sort of person I want to be and that can involve you know particular uh, virtues of you know do you value trustworthiness or truth or courage um, and so uh, I mean a great activity if this is something that you're um, studying or talking about at work uh, with your teammates the the Marcula Center has a number of case studies um, that you can talk through and we'll even ask you to kind of evaluate them you know evaluate them through these five lenses and how does that kind of impact your uh, uh, your take on what the what the right thing to do is it, it's kind of weird for a programmer a computer programmer or data science in some way in some ways to like think of these as tools like fast ai or pandas mm, or yeah. whatever but i mean they absolutely are this is like these are like software tools for your brain you know to, to help you kind of go through a, a program that might help you debug your thinking great thank you um, and then as someone brought up earlier, so that was a kind of very Western centric um, uh, intro to ethical philosophy. There are other ethical lenses and other cultures. Um, and I've, I've been do, uh, doing some reading, particularly on the, the Maori worldview. Um, I don't feel confident enough in my um, understanding that I could uh, uh, represent it, but it is very good to be mindful that yeah, there are other, other ethical lenses out there. And I do very much think that uh, you know the people being impacted by a technology like their uh, their ethical lens is kind of what matters and that this is is a particular issue when we have um, so many kind of uh, multinational uh, corporations and there's a interesting project going on in new zealand now where the new zealand government is kind of considering its ai approach and is at least um, ostensibly kind of wanting to wanting to include the maori view on that so that's a that's kind of a little a little bit of theory, um, but now I want to talk about some kind of practices you can implement in the workplace. 
again, this is from the Marcula Center. So this is their ethics toolkit, uh, which I, I particularly like. And I'm just, I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to tell you a few of my favorites. Uh, so tool one is ethical risk sweeping. And this, I think, is similar to the idea of kind of pen testing that uh, uh, Jeremy mentioned earlier from security, but to have uh, regularly scheduled ethical risk sweeps. Um, and while no vulnerability f vulnerabilities found is generally good news, that doesn't mean that it was a wasted effort and you keep doing it. Um, um, keep looking for, for ethical risk. Uh, one moment. Um, and then assume that you miss some risk in the initial project development. Also, you have to set up the incentives properly where you're rewarding team members for spotting new ethical risk. All right. Yeah, so I've got some comments here. I, I, so my comment here is about the learning rate finder, and I'm not going to bother with the exact mathematical definition, partly because I'm a terrible mathematician and partly because it doesn't matter. But if you just remember, oh, sorry, that's actually not me. I am just reading something that uh, uh, Patty Hendricks has uh, trained a language model of me. So that was me <laughs> reading the language model of me. That was great. It wasn't the real yeah. me. Cool, thank you. Um, <laughs> So this is a tool one. I would say another kind of example of this, I think, is like red teaming of, you know, having a, a, a team within your org that's kind of trying to, to find your vulnerabilities. Uh, tool three, uh, another one I really like, expanding the ethical circle. Um, so whose interests, desires, skills, experiences, and values have uh, we just assumed rather than actually consulted? Who are all the stakeholders who will be directly affected? Um, and have we actually asked them what their interests are? Who might use this product uh, that we didn't expect to use it or for purposes that we didn't initially intend? And so then a great um, implementation of this uh, comes from the University of Washington's Tech Policy Lab. Uh, uh, did a uh, on a project called Diverse Voices, and it's neat. They have both a academic paper on it, and then they also kind of have like a guide, a lengthy guide on how you would implement this. Um, but the idea is how to kind of organize uh, expert panels uh, around um, around new technology. And so they they did a few samples. One was they're considering augmented reality and they held expert panels with people with disabilities, people who are formerly or currently incarcerated and with women to get their, get their input and make sure that that was included. They did a second one on an autonomous vehicle strategy document and organized expert panels with youth, with people that don't drive cars and with extremely low income people. Um, and so I think this is a great guide if you're uh, kind of unsure of how do you even go about uh, setting something like this up to uh, expand your circle, include uh, include more people, um, and get uh, get perspectives that uh, may be underrepresented by your your employees. Um, so I just want to let you know that this resource is out there. Tool six is think about the terrible people. Um, and, and this can be hard because uh, I think we're often, you know, thinking uh, kind of positively or thinking about people like ourselves uh, who, who don't have terrible intentions. Um, but really think about uh, who might want to abuse, steal, misinterpret, hack, destroy, or weaponize what we build. Um, who will use it with alarming stupidity or irrationality? What rewards, incentives, openings has our design inadvertently created for those people? And so kind of remembering back to the section on metrics, you know, how are people going to be trying to, to game or manipulate this? And how can, how can we then remove those rewards or incentives? Um, and so this is, this is an important, uh, kind of important step to take. And then tool seven is closing the loop, um, ethical feedback and iteration, remembering this is never a finished task, and identifying feedback channels that will give you kind of reliable data and integrating this process with quality management and user support and developing formal procedures and chains of responsibility for ethical iteration. And this tool reminded me of a blog post by Alex Fierce that I really like. Alex Fierce was previously the chief legal officer at Medium. And yeah, I guess this was a year ago. He interviewed something like 15 or 20 people that have worked in trust and safety. And trust and safety includes content moderation, although it's not, uh, not solely content moderation. 
And uh, kind of one of the ideas that came up that I really liked uh, was one of uh, one of the people, and so many of these people have worked in trust and safety for years at big name companies. Um, and one of them said, uh, the separation of product people and trust people worries me because in a world where product managers and engineers and visionaries cared about this stuff, it would be baked into how things get built. If things stay this way, that product and engineering are Mozart and everyone else is Alfred the Butler, the big stuff is not going to change. Um, and so uh, I think at least two people in this kind of talk about this idea of needing to better integrate trust and safety, which are often kind of on the front lines of seeing abuse and misuse of a technology product, integrating that more closely with uh, product and eng um, so that it can kind of be more directly incorporated and you can have a, a tighter feedback loop there about uh, what's going wrong and, and how, um, how that can be designed against. Okay, so those were, these were, well, uh, I, I linked to a few blog posts and research I thought relevant, but inspired by the Mar Marcula Center's uh, tools for, for tech ethics. And um, hopefully those are practices you could think about potentially implementing at your, at your company. So next I wanna get into uh, diversity, which I know came up earlier. Um, so, uh, only 12% of machine learning researchers are women. Uh, so this is kind of a very, uh, very dire statistic. Um, there's also a kind of extreme lack of racial diversity and age diversity um, and other factors. Um, and this is, this is significant. Um, a kind of positive example of what diversity can help with uh, in a post, uh, Tracy Chow, who was an early, early engineer at Quora and, and later at Pinterest, um, wrote that the first feature, and so I think she was like one of the first five employees at Quora, uh, the first feature I built when I worked at Quora was the block button. I was eager to work on the feature because I personally felt antagonized and abused on the site. And she goes on to say that if she hadn't been there, you know, they might not have added the, the block button as soon. And so that's kind of like a direct example of how, how having a diverse team can help. Uh, so my kind of uh, key, uh, key advice uh, for anyone wanting to increase diversity is to start at the opposite end of the pipeline from, from where people talk about uh, the, the workplace. Um, I wrote a blog post five years ago, if you think women in tech is just a pipeline problem, you haven't been paying attention. And this was the most popular thing I had ever written until Jeremy and I wrote the, the COVID-19 post last month. Uh, but so the kind of second most, uh, most popular thing I've written. Um, but I, I linked to a ton of, a ton of research in there. A key statistic to, to understand is that 41% of women working in tech end up leaving the field compared to 17% of men. And so this is something that uh, recruiting more girls into, into coding or tech is not going to address this problem if they keep leaving at very high rates. I just had a little peek at the YouTube um, chat and I see people are asking questions there. I just wanted to remind people that uh, uh -huh. we are not, um, that Rachel and I do not look at that. If you want to ask us questions, you should use the, uh, the forum thread. And, uh, and if you see questions that you like, then please vote them up, such as this one. How about an ethical issue bounty program, just like the bug bounty programs that some companies have? No, I think that's a neat idea, yeah, of uh, rewarding people for, for finding ethical issues. Um, and so the, the reason that uh, women are more likely to leave tech um, is, and this was found in a meta-analysis of over 200 books, uh, white papers, articles, uh, women leave the tech industry because they're treated unfairly, underpaid, less likely to be fast-tracked than their male colleagues, and unable to advance. Um, and, and too often, uh, diversity e efforts um, end up just focusing on white women, which is wrong. Um, interviews with 60 women of color who work in STEM research found that 100% had experienced discrimination and their particular stereotypes varied by race. And so I would say it's very important to, to focus on women of color in, in diversity efforts um, as, a, as a kind of the top priority. Um, a study found that men's voices are per perceived as more persuasive, fact-based, and logical than women's voices, even when reading identical scripts. Researchers found that women receive more vague feedback and personality criticism in performance evaluations, whereas men are more likely to receive actionable advice tied to concrete business outcomes. 
When women receive mentorship, it's often advice on how they should change and gain more self-knowledge. When men receive mentorship, it's public endorsement of their authority. Um, only one of these has been uh, statistically linked to getting promoted. It's the public endorsement of authority. And all these studies are linked to in another post I wrote called The Real Reason Women Quit Tech and How to Address It. Is that a question, Jeremy? Or um, yeah, so if you're interested, kind of uh, uh, these two blog posts, I link to a ton of ton of relevant research on this, um, and I think this is kind of the the workplace is the the place to start in in addressing these things. Um, so another issue is um, tech interviews are terrible for everyone. Um, so now kind of working one step back from people that are already in your in your workplace, but thinking about the interview process. Um, and I wrote a post on how to make tech interviews a little less awful and went through a ton of research. And I will, I will say that the, the interview problem, I think, is a hard one. I think it's very time consuming and hard to, to interview people well. Um, but uh, kind of the two uh, most interesting pieces of research I came across, one was uh, from Triple Byte, which is a, a, a recruiting company that uh, interviews uh, kind of does this uh, first round technical interview for people. And then uh, they interview at Y Combinator. It, it's a Y Combinator company. And then they interview at Y Combinator companies. And so they have this very inter uh, interesting data set where they've kind of given everybody the same technical interview. And then they can see which companies people got offers from when they were you know, interviewing at many of the same companies. And the number one finding from their research is that the types of programmers that each company looks for often have little to do with what the company needs or does. Rather, they reflect company culture and the backgrounds of the founders. Um, and this is something where they even uh, they even gave the advice of if you're job hunting, uh, look for, try to look for companies where the founders have a similar background to you. Um, and that's something that while I, um, that makes sense, that's going to be much easier for certain people to do than others, and particularly given the, the gender and racial disparities in VC funding, that's going to make a big difference. Yes? Um, actually, I would say that was the most common advice I heard from VCs <clears throat> when I became a founder in the Bay Area, was when recruiting, focus on getting people from your network and people that are as like-minded and similar as possible. That was by far the most common advice that I heard. Yeah, I mean, this is I mean, I, maybe like one of my controversial opinions. I, I do feel like ultimately, like I get why people hire from their network. And I think that long term, uh, we all need to be developed, well, particularly white people need to be developing more diverse networks. And that's like a, you know, like, 10 year project. That's not something you can do right when you're uh, uh, hiring, but really kind of developing um, uh, a diverse uh, network of, of friends and, and, and trusted acquaintances uh, kind of over time. Um, but yeah, thank you for that perspective too, Jeremy. Uh, then, then kind of the other study I found really interesting uh, was one where they they gave people uh, resumes, and, and in one case, uh, so one resume had more academic qualifications, and then one had more practical experience, and then they uh, switched the gender. One was a woman, one was a man, uh, or you know, male name, a female name. Um, and basically, people were more likely to hire the male, and then they would use a post hoc justification of, oh, well, I chose him because he had more academic experience, or I chose him because he had more practical experience. Um, and that's something that I think it's very human to, to use post hoc justifications, uh, but it's a, it's a real risk uh, that uh, definitely shows up in hiring. Ultimately, AI or any other technology are developed or implemented by companies for financial advantage, i.e. more profit. Maybe the best way to incentivize ethical behavior is to tie financial or reputational risk to good behavior. In some ways, similar to how companies are now investing in cybersecurity because they don't want to be the next Equifax, can grassroots campaigns help in better ethical behavior with regards to their use of AI? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, and I think there are a lot of analogies with cybersecurity, and I know that uh, for a long time, I think it was hard for people to make, uh, or people had trouble making the case to their bosses of why they should be investing in cybersecurity, particularly because cybersecurity is, you know, something like when it's working well, you don't notice it, um, and so that can be can be hard to build the case. Um, so I, I, I think that there there is a place for grassroots campaigns. Um, 
and I'm, I'm going to talk more, uh, I'm going to talk about policy uh, in a bit. Um, it can be hard in, in some of these cases where there are not necessarily meaningful alternatives. Um, um, so I, I do think like monopolies can kind of kind of make that harder. Um, that's a, yeah, a good, uh, good question. All right, so next step, um, actually on this slide is uh, uh, the, the, the need for policy. Um, and so I'm gonna start with a, a case study of uh, what's, uh, what's one thing that gets companies to take action. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, an investigator for the UN found that Facebook played a determining role in the Rohingya genocide. Uh, I think the best article I've read on this was by Timothy McLaughlin, who did a super, super in-depth dive um, on um, Facebook's role in Myanmar. And uh, people, people warned Facebook executives in 2013 and in 2014 and in 2015 how the platform was being used to, to spread hate speech and to incite violence. Uh, one person in 2015 uh, even told Facebook executives that uh, Facebook could play the same role in Myanmar that the radio broadcast played during the Rwandan genocide. And uh, radio broadcast played a very uh, uh, terrible and kind of pivotal role in the Rwandan genocide. Um, somebody close to it th this said, that's not 2020 hindsight. The scale of this problem was significant and it was already apparent. Um, and despite this, uh, in 2015, I believe Facebook only had four contractors who even spoke Burmese. Uh, the language of B of Myanmar. Question? That's an interesting one. How do you think about our opportunity to correct biases in artificial systems versus the behaviors we see in humans? For example, a sentencing algorithm can be monitored and adjusted versus a specific biased judge who remains in their role for a long time. Um, I mean, well, but theoretically, though, you... Uh, I think I feel a bit hesitant about the it's it will be easier to uh, correct bias in algorithms um, because I feel like the you still need people kind of making the decisions to prioritize that like it it requires kind of an overhaul of, of the system's priorities I think um, it also starts with the premise that there are people who can't be fired or disciplined or whatever, yeah. which I guess maybe for some judges that's true, but that kind of maybe suggests that judges shouldn't be lifetime appointments. Yeah, because I mean, even then I think you kind of need the, the change of heart of the people advocating for the new system, which I think can... Uh, uh, would be necessary in other case kind of and that that's kind of the critical piece of, of getting the the people that are wanting to overhaul the values of a system um so uh, uh returning to to this issue of 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 um of the rohingya genocide and this is a kind of continuing continuing issue um you know this is something that's just kind of uh, uh, really stunning to me that uh that there were so many warnings and that so many people tried to raise an alarm on this and that uh, so little action was taken. And even this was last year, uh, uh, Zuckerberg finally said that Facebook would add, or maybe, maybe this was actually, this was probably two years ago, uh, said that Facebook would add, but this is, you know, after genocide's already happening, um, Facebook would add uh, dozens of Burmese language content reviewers so in contrast, so we have this, this is how Facebook really failed to respond um, in any, any significant way in Myanmar. Um, Germany passed a much stricter law about hate speech, uh, net, net, net GG, um, DZ, uh, and the, the potential penalty would be up to like 50 million euros. Facebook hired 1,200 people in under a year because they were so worried about this penalty. And so, um, and I'm not saying like, this is a law we want to replicate. Um, here, I'm just illustrating the difference between being told that you're contributing or playing a determining role in a genocide versus a significant uh, financial penalty. We have seen what the one thing that makes Facebook take action is. <laughs> 
Um, and so I think that that is really uh, significant in remembering uh, what the uh, what the power of a of a credible threat of a significant fine is, and it has to be a lot more than you know just like a cost of doing business. Um, so I I really believe that we need both policy and ethical behavior within industry. Um, I think that policy is the appropriate tool for addressing negative externalities, misaligned economic incentives, uh, race to the bottom situations, and enforcing accountability. Um, however, ethical behavior of uh, individuals and of data scientists and software engineers working in industry is very much necessary as well, um, because the law is not always going to keep up. It's not going to cover all the edge cases. Uh, we really need the people in industry to be making uh, kind of ethical ethical decisions as well. And so I believe. Um, both are, are significant and important. Um, and then and something to, to note here is that um, many, many examples of uh, kind of AI ethics issues, um, and I haven't talked about all of these, but there was a uh, 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 Amazon's facial recognition. The ACLU did a study finding that it in incorrectly matched 28 members of Congress to criminal mugshots, and this disproportionately included Congress people of color. Um, there's also, <laughs> this was a terrible article, uh, not the, the article was good, but the, the story is terrible, of a, a, a city that's using this IBM dashboard for predictive policing, and a city official said, oh, like whenever you have machine learning, it's always 99% accurate, which is uh, false um, and quite concerning. Uh, we, had, we had the issue in, uh, so in 2016, ProPublica discovered that uh, you could place a housing ad on Facebook and say, you know, like, I don't want Latino or black people, or I don't want wheelchair users to, to see this housing ad, uh, which seems like a violation of the, the, the Fair Housing Act. Um, and so there's this article, and Facebook was like, we're so sorry. And then over a year later, it was still going on. Um, ProPublica went back and wrote another article about it. Uh, there was also this issue of dozens of companies were placing ads on Facebook, job ads, and saying, like, we only want young people to see this. Uh, there's the Amazon creating the recruiting tool that penalized uh, resumes that had the word women's in it. Um, and so something, something to note about these examples and many of the examples we've talked about today is that uh, many of these are about human rights and civil rights. Um, and it's a good article by Dominique Harrison of the uh, Aspen Institute on this. Um, and I kind of uh, agree with Anil Dash's framing. Um, he, uh, he wrote, uh, there is no technology industry anymore. Tech is being used in every industry. And so I think in particular, uh, we need to consider uh, human rights and civil rights, uh, such as housing, education, employment, criminal justice, voting, and medical care, and think about what rights we, uh, we want to safeguard. And I, I do think policy is uh, the appropriate way to do that. Um, and I think, um, I mean, it's, it's very easy to be uh, discouraged about, uh, about regulation, um, but uh, I think sometimes we overlook uh, the, the positive uh, or the cases where, where it's worked well. Um, and so something I really liked about Data Sheets for Data Sets by Timnit Gebru et al. is that um, they go through three case studies of how standardization and regular, uh, regulation came to different industries. Um, and so it's the electronics industry around circuits and resistors. And so there, that's kind of around the standardization of, you know, what the specs are and what you write down about them, um, the pharmaceutical industry and car safety. And, and, and none of these are perfect, um, but it's still, a, it was a kind of very illuminating, the, the case studies there. Um, and in particular, I got very interested in the car safety one. Um, there's also a great 99% uh, invisible episode. This is a design podcast about it. Um, and so some, some things I learned is that, um, Early cars had sharp metal nods on the knobs on the dashboard that could lodge in people's skulls in a crash. Non-collapsible steering columns would frequently impale drivers. And then even after the collapsible steering column was invented, it wasn't actually implemented because there was no economic incentive to do so. Um, but it's uh, the collapsible steering column has, uh, they said, saved more lives uh, than anything other than the seatbelt uh, when it comes to car safety. 
Um, and there was also this just this widespread belief that cars were dangerous because of the people driving them. And it took um, it took uh, consumer safety advocates decades to just even change the culture of discussion around this and to start uh, kind of gathering and tracking the data um, and to put more of a, an onus on car companies uh, around safety. Uh, GM hired a private detective to trail Ralph Nader and try to dig up dirt on him. Um, and so this was really a, a battle that we kind of... Uh, I take for granted now, um, um, and so uh, kind of shows how much uh, how much it can take to to change uh, change the needle there. And then a kind of a, a more recent uh, um, issue is that it wasn't until I believe 2011 that it was required that uh, crash test dummies start representing the average female anatomy um, in addition to. Uh, previously it was kind of just uh, crash test dummies were like men um, and that uh, in a crash with the same impact women were 40 percent more likely to be injured than men because that's kind of who the the cars were being designed for um, so I thought I thought all this was very interesting and it can be helpful to kind of remember um, remember some of the successes we've had um, and another area that's very relevant is um, um, environmental protections and kind of looking back um, and uh, 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 Maciek uh, Siglowski has a great article on this, but you know, just remembering, like in the U.S., we used to have rivers that would catch on fire, and uh, London had terrible, terrible smog, and that these are things that were, uh, you know, very would not have been possible to kind of solve as an individual. We really need a kind of coordinated, uh, coordinated uh, regulation on. All right, and so then on a um, kind of closing note, so I think. Uh, uh, a lot of the problems I've touched on tonight are really <laughs> huge, um, huge and difficult problems, and they're often kind of very complicated. And I, uh, and I go into more detail on in this in the course, so please, so please check out the course uh, once it's once it's released. Um, I always try to offer some like steps towards solutions, but I realize they're not uh, they're not always you know as satisfying as I would like. Of like this is going to solve it, um, and that's because these are really uh, really difficult problems. <laughs> And Julia Angwin, a, a former uh, a journalist from ProPublica and now the editor-in-chief of The Markup, um, uh, gave a really great interview on privacy last year that I liked um, and found very encouraging. She said, I strongly believe that in order to solve a problem, you have to diagnose it and that we're still in the, di the diagnosis phase of this. If you think about the turn of the century and in industrialization, we had, I don't know, 30 years of child labor, unlimited work hours, terrible working conditions, and it took a lot of journalists muckracking and advocacy to diagnose the problem and have some understanding of what it was, and then the activism to get laws changed. I see my role as trying to make as clear as possible what the downsides are and diagnosing them really accurately so that they can be solvable. That's hard work and lots more people need to be doing it. Um, and so I found that really encouraging um, and that I do, I do think we should be working towards solutions, but I think just at this point, even better diagnosing and understanding kind of the complex problems we're facing is, is valuable work. Um, a couple of people are very keen to see your full course on ethics. Is that something that they might be able to um, attend or buy or something? So it will be released for free uh, at some point this summer. And it was uh, there was a, a, a paid in-person version offered at the Data Institute as a certificate, uh, kind of s similar to how this uh, this course uh, will was supposed to be offered, you know, in person. Uh, uh, the data ethics one was in person, and that took place in January and February. And then I'm currently teaching a ver version for the Masters of Data Science students at USF, and I will be releasing the free online version, uh, yeah, later, sometime before July. <laughs> Thank you. I'll see you next time.